It's not about likes. It's not about followers. It's about creating a similar vibe to what we had back in the days. The electronic music scene exists on a field beyond right and wrong. In this world, creativity has no competition. As long as you do your things with passion, like-minded people will appreciate it. I think the groove is not only the groove of the, the techno music or of the, of the music, I think it is also a kind of lifestyle. Yeah, I think it's his lifestyle. I, I, I can't see he's stopping with it. He has always been really professional and really um, structured. One day I think uh, you will succeed. My name is Kevin, I'm 40 years old and I'm addicted to the groove. It started when I was around 12 years old. I got my first CD play which I connected to my Discman to be able to mix songs together. Later on I got more advanced equipment and became really active as a DJ. Between 20 and 30 I became one of the biggest organizers of rave parties, lived as a homeless and became a millionaire. In the last 10 years I went into personal bankrupt became world famous and moved to places that felt right for my soul. But let me back up a bit to 1996. Right, so now we are a little bit north of Gothenburg in Sweden. This is actually the area where I grew up. Uh, I lived in the White House until I was 14 years old. And this is also the place where I got my first CD player. And when I then later heard the first house music ever in my life, it was missing um, Total Remix. And I heard it on radio and it was like, wow, what is this? It, it, it just came to me like, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but it was like I have heard other genres before, like jazz and hip hop and dance music or whatever it was called. But when I heard this, I was like, it was like this, a click. Okay, this is my future, like house music. And there were people living here in the same street uh, who went to the same school. And um, once a week we had this session in the school where you could uh, play a track and uh, the other kids or whatever, uh, we're listening and then you could comment. Okay. I like it. I don't like it and stuff like people brought a lot of shit I mean like hip-hop music and uh, dance music or whatever And the funny thing was that the teacher allowed them to play the whole track like three four minutes long and then talk about it a little bit And I remember I brought this missing to school and I played it for one minute And then he took it out from the CD player and gave it to me and I was like what's going on? And he was like no no it's too much dunk 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 and I was like, okay, how nice. I also got a lot of uh, like lights and uh, speakers uh, when I lived here. So I actually had like a, not a super proper setup, but I had a little setup uh, for doing like discos at home and stuff like that. And I had this friend of mine living up here on the, on the hill uh, and he was about to throw a party and he asked me, okay, can I borrow your stuff? So I put it in two bags, walked up the street, set everything up properly and nicely done. At that age, I was like maybe 13 years old. And then after I set everything up and uh, installed the, the speakers and everything, he was like, okay, thank you, see you tomorrow. And I was like, what? So I was not even invited to the party at this time. That was, that was so fucking weird. So all this, the behavior and the fucking behavior from the teacher in the school, it was like fucked up. 
pretty fast I knew that I wanted to become a DJ. Uh, I went to some discos, I stood in a corner uh, looking at the DJ, how is he doing, what is he playing, how is he playing and I just tried in some way to learn how to do it. I bought CDs almost every week and like 97% of my collection was like club music and it gave me something to just have the music. When I was 17 I moved to the other side of the city with my father and brother um, and I lived uh, like in the attic of the house. I had this music room in the room but it did not really help out. I mean I was playing too loud anyway so uh, even the neighbors could hear the music. I got my first official gig back then uh, as well. It was on a talent show and I was a post DJ and I remember I played a lot of like club music which I thought was like okay this is this is the thing this is what what you want to hear but it was like this I mean people were more into I don't know Swedish hip-hop that kind of thing for some reason anyway after that I got uh, more and more requests uh, not only for like events and stuff but also uh, I got into the nightclub scene uh, in the city So Greta's nightclub, one of the biggest uh, gay bars in Sweden, and it uh, opens in 97. They actually asked me to, to play like R&B and hip hop and shit like that, but after only a few gigs I managed to change the dance floor into a more club vibe, um, which for me felt awesome. It felt in some way like, okay, this is where I belong. Not necessarily in the Greta's gay club, but in this environment of club music, people who actually enjoyed it, they appreciated it compared to the place where I lived earlier, where no one appreciated what I was playing. It's a pretty small dance floor, like only 10 meters, and the DJ booth behind a door. So you were standing like this. It felt weird. Okay, open 10 to 5, that's actually nice, that they still have the same opening hours. Uh, that's when I started her. I didn't come along with my father and his new wife, so they kicked me out from the house. This was uh, in, back in 2000. Uh, so what I did was that I went down to the social service office, whatever, and I was like, hey, I'm homeless now. Okay, here you have an apartment. So I moved in and I uh, went to this uh, high school. Uh, I managed to do two years uh, of some kind of theater, uh, studio recording techniques, uh, education, whatever. <laughs> and I remember the last day uh, we had this play uh, to set up, uh, like a final test or, or whatever. And one week before that, I went with my brother to Bulgaria. So the same day as the, the final play, we flew back to Sweden and the plane arrived in Stockholm and then I had to change to another one to go back to Gothenburg, I ended up busted. Because in the bag I had this knife and this throwing star and I, I was completely, I think I was like stressed in some way to, to only get in time uh, for the play. So I did not th thought about it. Um, Anyway, the police that came to the airport, they were pretty gentle, so they let me uh, on to the next plane. So I went down to Gothenburg, to the bus, to my apartment, changed clothes and went to the school. And people were like super angry at me. And I was like, yeah, 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 whatever, whatever. Are we doing this or not? And I mean, I knew my shit. So I knew exactly what I uh, had to do and, and stuff like that. So. It was a good play, uh, in my opinion, and but still, I, I did not like the, the people in the class and the, the environment uh, fully out and stuff like that. So what I did after the play was that I collected all my stuff, I sneaked out uh, through the back door and never saw one of them again. After I uh, graduated, I started to work with building uh, stages, uh, I worked as a runner, and after one year I was the manager. But it also came with, 
I mean, everything has pros and cons. And I lived like, okay, there is no tomorrow. So I did a lot of stupid shit. I ended up with a big debt. I got kicked out from the apartment. I needed to move back into my mom's place, which was not the most nicest thing. It worked out for a few months but then suddenly one day she just stood up and she was like okay you need to move out fuck off and i was like okay she she literally said the word fuck off and i was like okay i packed my shit up here and i dropped the key in the mailbox this was back in 2004 and uh, since then i have not talked to her because if someone tells me to fuck off i fuck off everything i owned was in a storage I slept in parking garages, in parks and stuff like that. I mean, people did not really wanted me to sleep in their places like couch surfing and, and shit. I was happy if I was able to get a shower every now and then. So later on, I took a job as a scaffold builder and I was like, okay, now I'm gonna uh, save up some money here and pay off my debt and make a decent life, but that didn't happen. Uh, instead, I continue to live like, okay, there is no tomorrow. And I uh, also bought this very, very crappy car that I used as a home for a while. I think a big reason why I ended up in the car uh, was uh, because in only a few years, uh, things changed. Uh, so it was not easy to get an apartment because of the debt. Um, and not a lot of people uh, were willing to, to, to rent an apartment. Um, but still, I was like, okay, but my plan was to do rave parties. What the fuck am I doing here? So maybe even then uh, it was a sign because this guy, I found this guy who uh, was willing to rent uh, the, his apartment and he had no questions. He did not ask what, what I did. He did not ask uh, from where the money came. And I was like, okay, yeah, finally, nice. So I moved in and I um, began to do rape parties. The rave scene and the music I mean, it became like uh, an addiction to me. Uh, I dressed up in rave clothes all the time, everywhere I went. I really became a clubber. And I remember the first party that I did, it was in like the city center of Gothenburg, uh, in a park, like up on a hill, um, next to a museum. Me and my brother rented a lot of equipment, drove up, carried the shit, set everything up, and then we're like, Okay, but we need electricity. We found this house and I've been asked to jump over and put in the cable. And then we got things up and running. And it was nice. Uh, I mean, it was that feeling when you, when you have an outdoor event and you, you feel the first track coming up in volume, you feel the bass, the sound together with the nature. I mean, still today it's an, it's an awesome feeling. Later on that night, um, after about two hours, I mean, people came. It was more or less 100 people there. And then, of course, the police came. Because we, we played, I mean, it was a loud volume. And the bass was like going down the hill and into people's apartments, like bedrooms and, and shit. So, of course, the police showed up. And when they showed up, uh, a friend of mine, he was, he was in the middle of his set and the policeman walked to him, um, to, to the table, and he was like, okay, shut down the music. And, and, and uh, my friend was like, shut up, shut up, I'm in the mix, I'm in the mix. And then the police were like turning all the knobs and just dragged the cord out, and it was a crazy situation. So me and my brother ended up in court because of this. It was like a harmless crime, but ended up <laughs> being caught for it, so. Stupid mistake, I guess, but it was a fun evening. People also wrote about it in a newspaper. There uh, was something like, okay, uh, two brothers wanted to just have a little rave and um, they stole electricity from a museum. 
but um, after all, the um, the museum and the municipality, or whatever, they did not press charge. So, um, and I was like, okay, maybe this was a sign as well that I should continue with Ray because it went well. Okay, it was not going on the whole night, but overall, it was a it was a good. So it was like a cool gathering of chill people. Yeah, we had a fun time. The guy who played when the police came was also the guy who introduced me to the first music door. Uh, he already re uh, used Reason and he was like, okay, this is the shit to make your own music. And I was like, make my own music? Sounds interesting. So I sat down, I looked at the door and I was like, what, what's going on here? How do I use it? I see a play button and I don't understand a shit here. And he explained, but still I was like, okay, it, it, it does not click for me, okay? I, I, I don't know how to do, or I, I had some kind of interest because I, I was interested in having some kind of studio set up. Uh, I had it in my earlier apartments, but still I did not click with the door this time. So after we got busted and ended up in court, I was like, okay, I'm still gonna continue doing rape parties. So the next party I did, uh, I called it back to the 90s. And it was in a big warehouse in a more or less abounded area, just one kilometer out of the city center. And it was, it was a success. Today is a lot of roads and shit, but here was the warehouse. Uh, it takes about 20 minutes to walk from the city to here, and it was no disturbing people, no one collapsed, or nothing like that. It was just awesome. So the nice thing with this was that the police came at like six in the morning and they drove the car in to the arena or the abandoned building, and they turned on the the blue lights, and it was mixed with my lights, and it was. It was interesting to see because they, they stepped out from the car and they were like, okay, this looks like a uh, after party, have fun. And they took off. And I was like, what? I was surprised, but of course I was, I was happy as well because we continue until like two in the day or something. And I mean, to, to, to have situations like this nowadays, I mean, come on, when does it happen? My unique thing back then as an organizer was that I chose new places all the time. I never went back to one place for another party. And um, that also made me one of the biggest organizers in the country uh, because I, I made success in having a party going on the whole night until the morning. You can have obstacles and it can be hard to when you forget something maybe missing cables or anything, but when you have everything set up and it keeps going and it runs to the end, I guess you can call it a successful party. It was not easy uh, with the other organizers um, at the same time to not end up uh, doing parties on the same evenings. And some of the organizers, they were pretty angry about it. So then I came up with the one and only solution. I booked the organizer as a DJ on my own rave and problem solved. They were there, they could not have an own party. People, they used my, my places afterwards and they set everything up. They had a party going on for like two or three hours and the police came and shut it down. So maybe it was meant for me to just do underground shit. We have had many fun times. Some were successful, some were not, but all of them was to remember. It was fun parties. I also had a girlfriend who was a clubber uh, that I met on a rape party. So for a while in my life I was like, okay, I have everything I want. I do what I like. This will go on forever. I'm not gonna lie about it. I mean, I made good money on it. And uh, I lived out of my rape parties. With a lot of money that I made, I chose to buy my own equipment because I was not interested in renting all the time. I wanted to have my own. But of course, every, everything is not like as pretty as it looks. Of course, there's a backside as well. And people got jealous. 
They uh, broke into my apartment, they uh, broke into storages I had, they stole uh, equipment, lasers, speakers, uh, and they also smashed my card with stones and, and, and shit. And one day came in 2008 when I was like, okay, I'm tired of this shit now. I'm gonna do the last rave party and, um, and then the era for me is over. So I did it in uh, right before the summer. Um, about 2,000 people showed up. Uh, it was uh, the biggest party that I uh, organized back then. And after that, I sold everything. I sold the um, speakers, lasers, players, everything. I just got rid of everything. And with the money that I made from the ray parties and the money that I got from selling everything, I paid off my debt, I traveled and I bought a new car. And I also moved to another apartment and I built a small uh, music studio. I was like, okay, I, I did not like reason so much, but it must be some other door on the market. So I looked around and this Cubase came up. And then um, my, my friend uh, Per, um, who used uh, Reason, uh, he came up with, okay, but you need to buy a really, really fat synthesizer, like a proper one. And I was like, hmm. So I went into the city, I asked in a music store, hey, where can I buy a virus? Oh, we have one right there, okay. How much is it? Oh, it's like 1200 euro. So I put it at home, used it once. I mean, <laughs> I, I did not click with Cubase either. I think it was that. Uh, because it, it, it was a nice machine, but I never used it. I was listening to Energy Extravagance every weekend, and it was like the best radio show uh, to hear new club music. So this uh, album remixed by Brooklyn Bounce was actually one of the foundations to why I started uh, with DJing and mixing. And one thing that I noted was that I saw on a lot of CDs and I heard uh, people talk about Ibiza. And I was like, okay, it sounds so cool. And I wonder what it really is. I remember the first time when I went to the island, it was like, okay, the island got me. It was like some aura over the island. And I met this guy and he was like, when you come to Ibiza, either the island will accept you and you will come back, or the island will not accept you and this will be your only visit. I explored more and more outside of Sweden, the, the festivals, the club scene, and I was like, here it is going on like for real. It's like, like here they are really raving. I mean, from from uh, late evening until maybe late evening again. I mean, here I really felt the vibe. I did not want to continue with rave parties, but I wanted to do something, uh, to be creative in something that also had to do with the music. Then I went to Sensation in Copenhagen, Denmark. And when I was standing there, in front of this massive ocean of white setup, I was like, I know I was a Lego nerd when I was a kid, so maybe this is possible to build as a Lego model. So for about one month I just locked myself up and I built the construction uh, behind closed doors. I showed nobody until it was finished. Um, here is the table uh, where I built the construction. Uh, as you can see here is the control center. Okay, here we are. Uh, the stage, two meters. Uh, it's about... Uh, 550 bricks in uh, this one. 
Uh, then I also made a video of it. And I burned it on a disc and I posted it down to IDNT's headquarters in Amsterdam. And I had no intention of anything at that moment. I was more like, okay, I just want to show I built a model of sensation. So I mounted about half of it and then uh, my phone called and it was not a Swedish number. And I was started to shake and I was like, okay, uh, of course I will answer. The person in the phone was like, oh, hello, uh, is this Kevin? Yeah. Okay, I'm calling from IDNT headquarters in Amsterdam and we received your uh, mail and we want to buy your model to have it here in the headquarters. Is it possible? And I was like, it is possible. So um, later on, me and my brother, we took off down to Amsterdam. an awesome experience it was uh, it was really interesting and this person uh, Dennis he explained to me okay so we received the mail and I was in a meeting the person at the front desk opened it she looked at it and then she took everything and she just knocked on my door and she was like okay sorry for interrupting the the meeting here but you really need to see this so he went out and they pressed play and I was like what the f and then they showed it for Duncan, the, the founder of the company, and he was like, what the fuck? And then they sent it to their um, office in Belgium, and the people there was like, what the f I built the model in their lobby, and then it was two nights of Wicked Wonderland, and it was probably the best sensation evenings that I ever been to. I mean, everything was so nice, done it was i remember they had this champagne setup going on it was a very proper restaurant and they even had this costume made motorcycle it was this pre-party on a boat and it was the first sensation night with, with a nice dinner and then we went on to an after and then we slept a little bit and then it was the second night and people just went crazy Six in the morning, Sander Van Dorn was pumping out of a speaker and people started to climb up uh, on the stage and people were just crazy everywhere. After that, we went into an after party in uh, the headquarters of IDNT and I was like, okay, now this is what I really connect with. Then we went back to Sweden and I was like, okay, hmm, maybe I can build Wicked Wonderland as a Lego model as well. So. I did. After I built it, I made a video, sent it down to IDNT, and um, they replied to me pretty quick. Uh, okay, Kevin, it's even more awesome than Ocean of White, but uh, we have not really a space to place it. Uh, and no hard feelings. I mean, for me, it meant so much that they really appreciate the 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 job that I did. Uh, so they decided uh, to use the the video uh, for some marketing later on uh, and the model was sold to a person in sweden instead not as a model i mounted it down so in 2010 i was like okay i have experienced so much outside of sweden so sweden does not give me anything more so i got rid of everything <laughs> i um, i moved out from the apartment um, and I had some kind of garage sale. I sold my car, I sold everything. All I owned was one bag with clothes. And I was like, okay, Spain, here I come. So I bought a flight ticket down to Gran Canaria. And I was like, okay, this is the place. Because back then, this was like in 2010, it was when the, the ring in Playing Le was still rocking. And uh, there was this club called La Leche, which played really, really nice club music. I have visited the island before and it was something that connected with me. And I was like, okay, let's start a new life down on the island. 
I uh, stayed for a while, played as a DJ, but things did not really work out as I, okay, I had no plan, but I was thinking that it maybe it could have gone more smooth than it did, but I think it was just not the right time in my life. So in 2011, I moved back to Sweden and I was like, okay, I need money fast. So I took a job as a driver and uh, then I bought my first apartment and I also bought my first Mac because I was like, okay, maybe I should try Logic. Maybe now this is the time when I will feel a click and um, it clicked. I also started a new event company and I was like, okay, I'm gonna continue as a DJ, but I also gonna do events because some part of me could not let go of all the raves that I did in my early years. And I was like, I want to create events. I want to, to have this vibe. I want to, 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 to feel like, okay, I actually create something that makes people happy. So I started to do events in Sweden, Norway, Finland, and stuff like that, and it worked. It was not raves, but it was underground. after party started like 5 in the morning and then it ended like 11, 12 in the day and at that moment I have booked a cleaning service. So I mean it was easily worth it to pay like I don't know 100, 150 euro uh, for people to come to clean up the place and you don't have to think about it. I was so into music so I actually brought like DD equipment like everywhere and play like in parks and in uh, people's homes and uh, I played at clubs as well. Uh, but I could not go on one single day without hearing some beats. It was a lot of spontaneous parties, barbecues, lazy Sundays, hangover rhythms and, and stuff like that. And then I came up with what I thought was a brilliant idea. Maybe I should do the party of the year. The pool house agreed to it. I mean, I rented it. Sound went in, light went in, everything was nice and properly set up with this big banner. And I just felt like, okay, nice, I, I create something here. At uh, 8 p.m. the doors open, boom. It was interesting to see. I mean, I think I had 500 tickets available. Seven were sold. It was so empty in the house and newspapers wrote about it. It was like the flop of the year. But still, I did not felt bad. I felt proud in some way. I lost about 20,000 euro on the project, but I had fun. So it was totally worth it. Wickwardland uh, is pretty much more, uh, quite ex more expensive than sitting in the studio and making uh, a song, for example. So um, I believe it's much more difficult to make a Wicked Waterland over and over for, for, for many years until it uh, reaches out to a lot of people, but um, because it costs, costs so much money each time, but if a person uh, had that kind of money, I think it would be a, a success. The concept was nice, the place was nice, and there was state of the art equipment, but the location was just wrong. If it would have been closer to Stockholm or close to Copenhagen, it would have worked, no doubt about it. I know people took the idea and tried it out in the same arena in 2014, 2015, but it didn't work that year. So I'm super convinced that the city and the location is just not made for things like this. But all credit and respect to Kevin Odette to take the step to do it in a way. I think that the idea was super nice. 
but it was not the right thing for me to do in Sweden. It was just not the, the right place. Uh, and also I was not allowed to, to serve alcohol. And as we know, people in Sweden, they need alcohol to go out. If we would have stuck with the concept and done it every year, like consecutively up till now, then maybe it would have been the biggest festival in Sweden. Nobody can say. Everything can always be better, okay? But still, I learned shit uh, from it. So, and I, and I don't regret it. Still today, almost 10 years later, I still, I don't regret it. It was an awesome project. So in 2014, I went down to Ibiza again, and I went into the Club Ushuaia. And I was standing in the front of the stage, and um, I was thinking, it's a nice stage. I wonder if I can build it as a Lego model. I locked myself up for months, ordered a lot of bricks. It was like two and a half meter by 160, and it was like so detailed, so even when I look at it today, I get goosebumps when I, when I see the video I made of it. I posted the video on a USB stick down to Ushuaia, heard nothing. And the model, I was like, this time I'm not gonna touch it. A few months later, I went down to the island. And when I was sitting there in, a, in my hotel, I received an email. Hey, are you on the island? Can you come for a meeting on Wednesday at two, two o'clock? I think it was. And I was like, yeah. I am on the island. I went there on a meeting, went into the room uh, and I met the, uh, the person who runs the hotel, Jan Pissene. It was an awesome, awesome meeting. I mean, the guy is super nice. He is an awesome person. And in his office, there was these small mini figures everywhere. And I was like, in some way, this, guy is still a kid like me so i can clearly understand why he liked the, the model later on his brother Rumen came into the room and it was like oh this is kevin from sweden who built the lego model and Rumen was like <gasps> he was so surprised of seeing me there and it was just a nice talk for like 20 minutes and then he was leaning back and it was like Okay, but I want to buy the model. I want the model here in my hotel next season. Okay, how will we get the model down to Ibiza? And they came up with a lot of solutions. Can we put it in a private plane together with Avicii? Or can we send it by truck? I was just sitting there <laughs> listening to all this talking. And then it became quiet and it was like, okay, we'll figure out later. But um, now I have a question for you. And I was like, yeah, how much do you want for the model? So in 2015, a lot of things happened. I wanted to feel creative. So I bought this new apartment, uh, like 110 square meter. And I was like, okay, let's restore it. It will be awesome. In the middle of this restoring process, whatever, I also went down to Ibiza to set up the Lego model in the tower lobby. So I packed everything down in boxes and I drove down with car to the island. So this is not going to so. Then we go. This is nice. This is view we får here when we turn down here. You can see the hamnen, the city. Now it's so that my cameraman here has not belted on him. Så den här svängen där man alltid får backa. Det spelar ingen roll om man kör smartkar eller hummer. Här får man alltid backa. It was amazing. The feeling when I went in and I saw this custom made table with mirrors and plexiglass. I mean, my brain was like, thanks to my interest of music and creativity, I ended up in one of the best clubs in the world, building a five square meter Lego model in their lobby unbelievable. Still today I can be surprised that I actually did it. People appreciate it. It was so so nice to see 
people's reactions and Jan, he looked at it like, for me, who, who see this area like almost every day, I can still see down to the smallest detail that you actually put into it. So it was it was amazing uh, grand opening 2015. Still today, more or less eight years later, when the Lego model is still in the lobby of the tower, it's so nice to actually have a Lego model in a top-rated hotel in the world. I mean, it's an honor for me. I was so inspired of the hotel experience, so I decided to even make a track. It was called Hummingbird and it was my first official release, which came out later in 2016. I also continued with my events and gigs and at this time in my life I was healthy, I made more money than I needed and I lived a life that I 10 years earlier only could dream about. The apartment was one of a kind. I mean, it was an amazing living room. The kitchen was super nice. It was the same theme through the whole apartment. It was walking closet, music studio. Just perfect, but it, it didn't felt right. So I decided to sell it and move to Stockholm. So when I came to Stockholm, I did not know anyone and I was like, okay, where should I live? I don't know any area. So uh, I ended up in the middle of the city center. I did not have the space to build a music studio, uh, but I had a little setup at home. And pretty fast I got into the, um, to the film and music industry, uh, found interesting people. But during the first year I was traveling a lot and I was doing a lot of video stuff and uh, I came up with this idea of doing a track called Bajan Girl. During two days we recorded uh, in Stockholm. It was in winter and it was freezing cold. Hot girl, girl, hot girl, she's interesting project. A lot of people appreciate it. Then after a while I saw an event on Facebook. It was a techno club that was going on in a basement of a restaurant and I was like why not? I just went in and down the basement. It was completely black with a few lights. I was like oh yes finally this is this is nice. This, this feels underground. And there I met a guy called Stefan and a guy called Gustav. I went to more techno clubs and the more I saw, the more I was like, okay, I like the vibe, it's nothing wrong, but still I, I miss something here. So I called Roger and I was like, let's start a concept where we record everyone who plays. So in December 1 in 2017, I made it official, Vibe Crib. We unite your heart with your soul. And the first event was held in a like office area. And I invited um, Samis and Frank with you to play, and uh, they came. Another DJ also came, and that was it. Yo dije, normal, esto es Suecia, sí. Yo lo, yo lo sabía, no, yo lo entendía. Aquí en Suecia es como que son un poco tímidos al principio. No todos, eh, a lo que he experienciado eh, Samis y su amigo, wow, esos son, esos saben tocar. Yo solo veo este tipo fuera de Suecia. 
Y de ver uh, en Estocolmo, ok, wow. I took it as a experience. I went back home and I was like, okay, it needs to be done in another way. Otherwise, people will not show up. So I contacted uh, Talkit in Gothenburg, this roof terrace bar uh, with a view over the whole um, port and uh, it's just a super nice place. So in May of 2018, we kicked off an event and uh, it was a fucking success. So after that event, I was like super thrilled of just creating stuff. So in the end of 2018, we made two events in Stockholm. It was here, the place was called uh, Little Tongue. Uh, it was in uh, October and December of 2018. My experience from that night with Vibe Crib was, um, it was a very intimate um, session with uh, very passionate people that were there and really dancing and enjoying the, um, the, the vibe. And I loved the location that we were in because it created this intimate vibration. And there was also people standing above uh, in another floor. Um, so that was also really nice. So here was the banner. It took up the whole wall, probably too big, but I wanted to show here we are this evening. And on the inside we have this uh, living candles and the vibe was just awesome. Everybody come together in this meeting and have a good time. It's like someone go to a coffee shop, but we do music instead. It was a bit difficult to not constantly like look I, because I want to see what's going on. How do people react? So I, I, I really wanted to see what's, what's going on. But um, uh, it was it was just a really really nice evening. Um, yeah, so I have very good memories from that. It was nice. Uh, the vibe was super nice, uh, but uh, still I wanted to have something else. There was something missing, even now. They're rebuilding it to a more ugly place. Now the balcony is like this small. Before it was like a little floor here and there was the balcony and right here was the, 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 the bar and the kitchen. This was an experience eh, interesante porque el eh, underground scene en Suecia no es grande, es pequeñito. Yo dije, wow, esto me está llevando a los clubes en Alemania. Lo que uno experiencia en Ibiza, en lugares pequeños, yo dije, wow, ahora, ahora estoy sintiendo la música y el, eh, la comunidad underground. Eso era interesante. We also did events uh, in other cities, for example, Malmö Kitchen Table, in a sky bar where you can see to Denmark. It was also nice, but the majority of, of the artists, uh, they are playing underground music, so why do we have to be above ground all, all the time? And then I decided to do a 100% um, analog vinyl techno event in a basement in Stockholm. Ja, det är här allt börjar. Man dricker kaffe och så blir man redo för dagen. Men det är inte överlåda den här. Jag kan inte sitta här. Jag kan inte sitta där. Det är bara att vänta på en uppbörd. Shit! Nu kör du musik lite. Vad händer? Ja men, eh, du har den här låt. Fan vad det luktar svett i den här jävla bilen känner jag. Fan, nu är det bra. Jag ska vänta på min 
mina grejer. Ja. Roger och Vira Bortsäg, han är ju ett cyklingshoppa. Du måste ha rating här då. Är det bra att vara den här resan? Nej, men den var ju så där, alltså. Den var fan... Så so I have to rate this uh, Uber uh, travel trip shit. Men, men vi kom ju fram utan krock och svårigheter. Ja. Ah, och det gick ja. hyfsat fort. Mm. Sen luktade det skit. Ja, han var inte det. övertrevlig, jag tycker han får en tvåa. Ja, ah, disappointing, det får man ändå ta. Ja. Oh. Det var inte dåligt, men det var luktade ju för fan gymnastiksal hela. We arrived, he made the drive, but it smells like shit in the car. The place was nice. You you came in uh, facing a small bar, went down the stair, uh, there was some kind of wardrobe, and then you continued. And on the right side, it was an unexpected barber <laughs> going on in the middle of the night, just cutting hair. And then we continue in the left, and there was another small bar, and then finally in the last room, the target for our night. The brand new Zone 96 Adam Heath Good stuff, hard stuff, hardcore Hardcore? <laughs> Wasn't this a techno party? We have two stycken som är good to go, they are very nyserved, they are clear in the first year So we will try to break the house with the house, so we will have a second The only thing that is on the other side is the lamp Shoot it then Han har med sig manualen till mixen, men han har inte med sig strumkabeln. Ja, okay. Hur fan tar med sig en manual? Han låg i lådan. Roger, hur tänkte du där? Det är originallådan. Har du med dig kvittot också? Ja. Det verkar inte fungera så bra, för det är inte inkopplat. Om man sätter ström i den så kanske den fungerar i alla fall. Har du manual på telefonen också? Ja, ja. <laughs> ja, vi är ju i en bunker. <laughs> nu blir det rök, paus! Hur gick det då? Ja, bra. Nu är det. Var det för dig? Det var uh, utläsande. Jag är nöjd. Var det bra? Det här, det här var mäkta trevligt. Det här uh, får vi spinna om igen. Förhoppningsvis väldigt snabbt. Jag kommer, jag gör min grej och drar. Och drar. Ja. Är de här? De här är ju typ så här musiga ja, och du vet. Ja. Och just att man, att man skapar den viben du vet. Ja. Att det var så här, det är aldrig är rent och snyggt och allt fungerar. Inga... Ja. Så, hur ser tidsramen ut? När känner du att du har anställda som gör det där åt dig? Det här? Ja. Jag inleder det här. Jaha. Det är Vad är manualen nu då? Vad fan kommer den vägen? Den går ju här. Där! We did it. I mean, we managed to create a vibe that was from back in the days, especially with the vinyls, and it was not a single cell phone during the whole evening. People were just there, bought some drinks and enjoyed the music. It was super nice. Maybe you have to be a special kind of person to enjoy this kind of music, because many people is saying it just sounds like disturbance. But if you're into it, you're into it. It's harder to create an event in, in Sweden than, for example, if I go to like Germany or the Netherlands or Spain or Belgium. I mean, let's say if you are lucky that the place closes at three, okay? Then you need to get in mood. I mean, like six in the evening, you know, to maybe pre 
party and play with music and it's much harder I mean for the audience for the organizers for for the for the artists and then when you when you when the when the last artist is, is doing his or her set and you really feel okay now now my blood starts to pump here then the venue closes so compare that to out in Europe where the vibe actually starts to get awesome at three. It's much bigger abroad than in Sweden. Sweden is pretty small, but when you go to Germany or something, it's 10 times as big. So yeah, you meet lots of more people with the same mindset also. After this event, we, we went uh, back to Gothenburg, did another event, and then we made our last uh, like public event at uh, Hotariet in in Stockholm, and uh, in the middle of the set of uh, Samis and Frank with you, of course, it started to rain. So people just helped me to put up three tents because I was like, no way, we shut this set down. It's not going to happen. We cannot kill the vibe for the artists. I have seen people create events and oh it starts to rain let's quit let's shut it down let's go home and i'm like what the fuck are you doing i promised the audience here to to deliver and i i am going to deliver so in 2019 i decided to leave sweden i bought a van and i was like Okay, where is it that I feel that I actually belong? And I decided to move to Ibiza. Dancing and prancing, grooving, keep on moving, flying, stop your crying, choosing while you're cruising. Music is the answer to your problems. Keep on moving, then you can solve them. The island is nice, uh, but it's not what a lot of people think. Uh, I mean, I have I have talked to so many people that think that you come with the airplane and you land more or less in a big speaker, but that's not the case. Música es una cosa, pero después tiene también el paisaje, no el el clima tiene una naturaleza linda. Si vienes a conocer Ibiza, no estoy hablando del, de los lugares turísticos, estoy hablando Ibiza profundo. Me deja relajar, despegarme de todo y ser de nuevo creativo, encontrarme y ser más eh, firme en lo que quiero hacer por el momento. You feel like it's breathing electronic music. The atmosphere, the vibe, the people, the happiness. It's just a paradise. So I definitely think you can enjoy being there regardless of your normal preferences. There's just simply no other place in the world like Ibiza. It's like another planet. I cannot put it into words for you what it's like, okay, this is the magic, you know? It's like you have to feel it. You feel it in the clubs, you feel it in the nature, you feel it in the sea, you feel it all around the island just already when you arrive with the plane there. It's like, yeah, there's no place like home. <laughs> The parties that you never hear about, that is where you want to be. That is where the vibe is amazing. And we have some uh, example of this. For example, in a bigger city in Spain, there is this place, you walk over a square, you go to a door, you press the doorbell, they let you in, you go up a few floors, you go through the apartment and take an elevator down to an abounded subway station. I mean, it's one of the most crazy places I have ever been to. It's like going to Ibiza, okay? If you don't know about the villa parties, you will never get invited. The whole point of having this underground is that it's secret. Everything is organized well, you know, you get picked up by an amazing driver, you get brought to the villa and you have to say your name obviously for the list and whatever. 
um, you get in and I mean this huge tree is over there and it's like okay mushrooms are hanging off you can take all the goodies that you want or someone is making punch in the backyard like a wizard you know we all know what it's in that punch right so <laughs> it's like um, those parties are insane and I also do think that they're very safe you're with the community and that again creates that special energy that I'm talking about you know it creates that higher vibration it creates what you want to feel through music and it's like you don't even need to, I'm, uh, you don't even need to take the drugs or whatever or anything you know you can just really feel it through the music that's always there and it's like when you share that with the community and there it's like I mean just come you know just let's go to those parties it's amazing Tú tienes que vivirlo, tú tienes que estar en ahí para, para entender. Esto no se puede explicar fácil. Eh, si tú no estás en ahí, tú no estás viviendo, tú no estás eh, pasándolo, es difícil de entender si te digo que es como un, eh, un encuentro de gente eh, creativa en música, en arte, en todo. ¿no? Y de esa forma compartimos ¿no? ideas compartimos eh, todo lo que escuchas ahora en el underground va a venir a tocarse en cinco años o diez años todo empieza ahí once wipe started to publish content from abroad the support and interest from sweden became almost zero i mean there are some people who are actually uh, interested and still ask how's it going but Overall, nothing. Eh, era una pena de, de ver de que la gente no conoce aún. Es porque están muy cerrados aquí en Suecia. Es, Sue, Suecia tiene un tipo de techno, un, un tipo, eh, no, no sé cómo explicarte, pero el, 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 el techno sueco es diferente, un poquito diferente. Tipo nórdico, nórdico techno, un poquito hacia el comercial, ¿no? eh, melodic, eh, comercial techno. What you see today on our YouTube and our, our uh, social media is like 10% of what we are doing. Because as soon as we landed in another country and started to network, people, I mean, they like the concept, they like how we do it and, and, and everything, but I always got requests of, hey, can we do it offline? You know, with the, with the old school jungle drum, you know, I tell someone who tells someone, you know, the closed circle. No photos, no cell phones, no after movies, no nothing. So that is, that is, that is the nice thing. In my opinion, VIP is a loser concept. The electronic music is about uniting people, not separating them by class. Commercial clubs and festivals are super nice for social media, but if you want to be where it really happens, you need to get invited to the hidden underground. So in 2021, we did a few recordings uh, in Ibiza, um, like view recordings with artists. We are at uh, Cala di Serra and uh, we just finished a recording of me uh, on this awesome setup in this awesome sunrise today. We have one boat, we had some people here uh, coming up in the morning. I was surprised to see them. Caveman, that was caveman. Yeah, I came, man, because <laughs> I started like <laughs> seven in the morning to play. It was so fucking early. <laughs> Everything works fine, uh, no issues. Everything is also placed in a very good way because I have seen people record DJ set and you know, they put the gear on a regular dining table. And I'm like, how, how, how the fuck can you as an artist agree to play on, on, on gear that is down here? I would never do it, never. Afterwards, uh, of course, I create the after movie, w which uh, the artist can use to promote themselves. And uh, I know that um, it really pays off with these videos. The video 
from Cala Fedeia was for me uh, a game changer. It was a game changer because I had suddenly really good footage, what I could use for my press kit, media kit, whatever I needed to send to bookers or promoters or, or wanted to get a gig sorted basically. And because the footage and the sound was done so well and so properly, I just got the gigs because it was amazing because of the sunset that was going on I was playing with the sunset basically so for me it was really like okay I'm gonna push it with the music and then I'm gonna get you into a vibe of the sunset kind of vibe you know and I got also a lot of compliments from strangers around like whoa that was such a journey with the sunset what you were doing with the music and for me that's that's the biggest biggest compliment that I could get that, that's it, because that's what I want to bring out, you know? Work with the people and work with a certain vibe. It was, oh, I cut this feeling. It feels like, wow, mm -hmm. medicine, it, you know? Like, this it, is. It was, yeah. it was, I could tell from seeing you that mm -hmm. you enjoyed it. Yes, yeah, that nice. was like, yeah. 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 I think we nailed it, both with the set and the concert. Yeah. It was like, boom. Yeah, yeah it was really nice. cool. Yeah. yeah, it was really dope. Wow, okay. Any party you're giving, I'm yes. coming. Yes. Yeah? Okay. okay, thank you guys. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. How amazing is it that there's still those people out there that want to uh, make you grow or when they see something and they really want to help you from their best attention, um, intentions. And I think in the time that we're living right now, there should be more of those people. We should all help each other because at the end of the day, we're doing it all together. I'm not doing this thing alone. I'm doing this all together with everyone. And I want to enjoy this journey that I'm on with music, with everyone that I love and is humble and pure in their hearts. And I think Kevin for me was that straight away when I met him. And yeah, I'm forever grateful for what he did for me because the video was, yeah, again, as I said, a big game changer for me. I think even Carl Cox responded on it. So it was like, well done, he said, or something like, yeah, he did. And that, yeah, I mean, it was um, uh, just the beginning. Yeah, just the beginning. In October 28, in 2021, I was in Ibiza town to pick up food and some other things. And I ran into this girl. The island itself was for me one big mystery. I heard a lot about it, but never went there. And I want to go to a place that I have never been before. And yeah, I decided to go with my mom to Ibiza. It was not so touristic, not so crowded. And I liked the vibe of the silence of the island too. I asked her if she wanted to go for a drink. And uh, yeah, okay, why not? For me, it really sounds interesting, okay? A person with a lot of yeah, interest in film and music living in a van in Ibiza. And it is a suite, it's not a local. <laughs> and um, after that, um, she took off and uh, went back home. sitting down and I was like, this person is actually living in Belgium. And I was like, Ibiza? Belgium. Hmm, can I have both? I think that the island is very close to his heart. I think that he really needs uh, a lot of creative vibes, but also different experiences. I think it's a need also for him to organize things. He likes it. He's passionate about it. Wild trip. Wild trip. Okay, so it's January 28th and now it's one in the afternoon and I have not even packed the fucking bag.
since I chose to be in the middle of a city and post about it on social media, but definitely not mainstream. You could see it on audience that were there and the artist, amazing performance. Nice to see when they when they like it. Huh. And now it's like coming back to an empty, like quiet hotel room. Just. It is like twelve degrees. Seventeen. Nice. You uh, doesn't like too much. Maybe it's a bit too much. You said twenty. I said seventeen. Seventeen. Yeah, I did seventeen. But it feels cold. Feel. I have been from homeless to luxury living 
but I was never a douchebag to people just because I made success in some things. It's interesting how the personality can influence the creativity too, or can influence the way of thinking about similar things. I think it, it will be interesting for the future. I think I did pretty good during the last 20 years, um, especially if I think of that I did not really had any music connections in my family. I mean, the closest I came was that my dad built the biggest drum in the world and he ran a country club. Everything else I did on my own um, in my life when it, when it comes to the, to the music and film uh, industry. You're sneaking on my new song. <laughs> this is my like classic shelf. Uh, it's all gone and grew to super good movies. Uh, the first house music I heard, Missing, and a bunch of other music here. It's nice to have uh, because every time I look at this shelf, I uh, realize and I remember why I found my interest in music. It's like super nice. This is my interpretation that he takes it very seriously and he's always very present and um, really good gear and um, he gave from the beginning really professional vibe. We've worked with uh, many people in the business and I would say that Kevin is a person you can really trust when he says you, he's going to put something together, he's got a day, he's got something, he really means it. And that's what the artists can feel that work with him, I think, because they can sense his passion for what he's doing. It's not, it's not all about making a big event and getting someone to talk about you. It's really about the passion for the music. He's not a person that just go every day in his music studio to start producing. He, he, he needs also a bit a kind of flow outside the studio. Will there be a world without music? <laughs> no, I don't think so. It will be a boring place, a great place. So I'm not the person who threw the biggest parties in the world. I'm not the most well-known name. But what I have learned so far during my journey is that nothing is more expensive than a missed opportunity. And people also ask what you are doing for a living so they can calculate the level of respect to give you.